Josh Rosenthal, breaking news reporter at Fox 5. And I, and I, and I was thinking, how long have you been there? Because I know that we have met in person. And it's been like three years, right? Yeah, I've been at Fox 5 for three amazing years now. I, I really do love working at Fox 5. We have met in passing, but, you know, especially with the pandemic and everybody coming and going and being out of the station, we have not spent nearly as much time together as I would like. So thank you so much for having me, Sarah. This is great. Well, and it's kind of hard because breaking news and gambling are really two not my fortes. You know, they're really not, they're really not things that I'm good at, you know, so... I'm not really great with getting sources correct, you know, or, and you know, I'm loosey goosey uh-huh. with the information. You know, I think I heard this. I, I'm a bad witness. So it's, it's not good. Well, that sounds like it might be okay for gambling though. One of my, one of my two main interests. That's okay. We've got a lot of loosey goosey types in the gambling world. Josh, how much money have you lost betting on the Washington football team? I can't even, I, I was watching some of your Instagrams. I'm like, why is this dude even getting conned into putting money on them? I know. You know what? A couple weeks ago, I swore them off because I had just lost again betting on the Washington football team, which is my team. Generally not a good idea to bet when you have emotion involved anyway. And I was like, I'm done with this. I'm not betting on him anymore. Then we had an expert come on the Rambling and Gambling podcast. And out of the blue, he's like, actually, I really like the Washington football team this weekend. And I said, okay, I'm back in. And now I'm back out because I lost money again. That's that's life being a WFT man. So. My husband loves he loves sports gambling as well. Um, is your wife into it? No, no, not at all. She'll sit with me, though, on the couch and hang out while we watch the game. It's like a family thing for us on Sunday. So she does like that part of it, but she doesn't get into the actual football at all. What's your favorite gambling app so far? Because I'm tempted to download Caesars only for the commercials. Like, I love the, <laughs> the commercials are so good. I'm like, it was really good. Yeah. I might have to. I might have to. What's your favorite app to use? Um, I like Caesar. So one of the things we talk about, actually, it's a really good idea to have a bunch of apps. So I have a ton of accounts and I'm not betting big money. I want to be clear about that. I was going to ask you that. FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars. Like I I have a bunch of them because you can line shop. Like maybe one app is offering like Washington plus three points, but this other app's offering Washington plus three and a half makes a big difference if you're betting every week over a long period of time. As I hit my mic by accident. <laughs> That's Sorry fine. That. Oh, please. Um, oh, so I was going to ask you that. Like, are you a big money gambler? Like, I mean, are we Michael Jordan here? Or like what? Uh, no. How much are you putting up? No, no. I'm like a, I'm like a, a bench warmer. I'm, I'm not, not even, uh, not, not even. Um, I well, bet. who has Jordan money, really? I mean, you know, no one's betting a million dollars on one golf hole except for like Jordan. But I mean, but my husband, I think, I don't know. Like, he has a limit of like. I don't know, hundred dollars a bet or two hundred dollars something. Like he does, I don't think he goes beyond whatever number. It's, it's so it's rare that I even go that high. Most of my bets are like twenty bucks, um, and this is kind of who we do the podcast for. It's mainly for people who were never going to have like an offshore account or a bookie, but. Now that it's legal in much of the U.S., including in D.C. and Virginia, and it's coming to Maryland very soon, they're like, you know what? I'm going to be watching the game this weekend anyway. I might as well put 10, 15, 20 bucks on it because it just makes it that much more enjoyable when I watch the game. I call it cost of admission betters. That's what I am. So that's what I do, 15, 20 bucks a pop. Um, I think it's really important. Unless you're really, really going to take this seriously, you're really going to do the research, you're going to treat it like a job, which I I do not do, Yeah. Um, then I, I think it's important that, if you lose your bet, you need to still be able to have a good day. Like, don't if, if it's blowing your whole weekend, I, you know, I wouldn't advise that. Well, you got a kid now, you know, and a wife. So I, I, I'm hoping that you're not, you know, gambling the mortgage. But, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's addicting. I mean, to some for some people it is. But uh, tell me about your podcast. How are you liking being a podcaster? Because it seems like you get oh. to have a lot more fun doing that. I mean, I know you like breaking news, but. Seems like it's fun. I love it. I absolutely love it. And not to be too complimentary of my Fox 5 DC bosses, but it's really cool to work at a place where like I do typically do a lot of breaking news, some like really like difficult stories. And I went to him one day and I was like, hey, we do a lot of po- podcasts at Fox 5. What do you think about a podcast for people who are into gambling? And it wasn't even that hard of a sell. They were like, great. This sounds awesome. Sure. Go for it. We'll back you up. And now this is what I do roughly one day per week I, the podcast does come out one day per week typically i that's what i get to spend on it and it's been fantastic 
I love it. Basically, we have a different expert on every week. We chat it up. Um, it's NFL season. Football's king. So we break down the games. We get best bets. We talk about their background, um, strategy, especially for casual gamblers like myself. It's been a blast. I love it. Um, when do you – it's called Rambling and Gambling, right? Yep, and that's wh- right. what days does it come out? Give yourself like all the plugs here. We're doing a crossover. Oh, oh <laughs> yes. Okay. I'd be – I'd be happy to. Yeah, it's called Rambling and Gambling. You can get it anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, please rate, subscribe, and review if you like it. That would be a big help. Uh, it drops every Wednesday. We have a new episode. I record the episodes every Tuesday. You can find me on IG2 at Rambling and Gambling. And it's been amazing. We've got a nice community of listeners who seem to really be enjoying it. I absolutely love it. And I will tell you, despite my Washington football losses sarah uh overall this has been a more profitable uh nfl season for me personally largely because of the advice that we've gotten from experts and and specific picks that we've gotten from experts on the podcast so that's one of those things that makes me feel like all right we're moving in the right direction if even i'm making a couple extra bucks on this hopefully all of our listeners are i mean what a genius idea josh like bring on you know this is like a hobby for you bring on all the experts mine them for all their tips and then you're making money i mean you know you you know how this came up so i i I get really neurotic about work like i'm I'm a little bit of a workaholic sometimes and i was talking to my wife one day and i was like you know sweetheart a lot of good podcasts at fox 5 i just all i'm doing right now is reporting should i do more and she said, okay, you're nuts. You don't need to do more. You're already busy <laughs> enough. However, she said, however, if you're going to insist on doing this, at least make it a podcast about something that you're already spending too much time on, like gambling. And boom, here, here we are. I said, you're a genius. And that's where the idea came from. So tell me about being neurotic. I mean, you know, about your job. <laughs> <laughs> What's that like to be, to be, you know? Well, it's been a, it's been a very difficult life, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, tell us about that. I mean, because I would think it, it almost could be like torturous, really, for you. You know, of uh, thinking yeah. of breaking news, and then you must leave the station. And you know, are you neurotic and then almost jealous too? Like you don't want anyone else to break news stories. I would be. I mean, I hate when other other podcasters succeed. Yeah, I. I, I mean, minus you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was very sweet. I um. Yeah, it it is kind of uh, tough at times. I I bet that most reporters would tell you that they're neurotic because you kind of have to be to succeed in this job. News does not happen on a schedule. I I had a boss back in the day. This is when I worked in Arkansas, of all places. And we had a bank in the same like kind of um, area as the station. And he'd always say, if you want a nine to five, go work at the bank. And he's right, because news happens when it happens. So you know, some of the biggest stories that I've covered happen to happen on a Saturday. And if it's a big enough deal, generally I'll call the bosses and say, Hey, I'm ready to roll. You need me. I'm good to come in. And so that does make you kind of neurotic because at least for me, it can be very hard to turn off. I'm always glued to my phone. You never know when something's going to happen. And that does kind of give you that little pit in your stomach. Sometimes it can be hard to deal with. However, it's also challenging because I, I would never work in a desk job. I'm just not that type of person. I'm never going to be able to have a nine to five. So it's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And overall, I, I don't want to paint like a negative picture here because I love it. I love what I do. I've been doing it forever. I, I don't ever want to stop. But the neuroses, yeah, that's a, that's a big part of it. I know. Do you do anything to like, do you meditate? Like, is it hanging out with your wife and your daughter? Like, how do you balance yeah, I'm a really big family guy. There's nothing that's more important to me than family. I now have a one-year-old daughter. She just turned one on November 1st. Love Her name it. is Felicity. And that is my everything. My wife and uh, my kid. And I love it. So, yeah, that's my big um, like way to like you know kind of come down. I, I absolutely love the weekends. Um this time of year football Sundays are big for us my wife doesn't love football but that's kind of like what we do we love watching it we love hanging out we'll cook dinner that is my everything and there's nothing in the world that's more important all right I, I want to know like about story that got away or by the way wait are you hearing feedback no okay let me just make a note I was feeling hearing feedback but now I'm not um okay tell me about a, a story that 
got away. Like that, that, like you, you know, you obviously, you're very passionate about your job. You love breaking news, but was there a story like you, you gone home or you, you kind of had a hunch, but you needed to do something and you missed it. And like, you always think about that. Yeah. I mean, I don't have one that stands out, but I definitely remember that feeling. Like, do you, you ever feel like sometimes you don't remember like a situation, but you do remember the way the situation made you feel? Totally. Um, totally. So, so that's what I have as an answer to this question. I get that feeling all the time. I would be willing to bet a lot of reporters do because you get, especially if you're like in the same place for a while, like I have been, at, you know, I've been at Fox 5 DC for three years. I'm, I'm from here too. So I have a lot of like contacts just because this is where I, I grew up. This is where my family is, all that you get like tips, sometimes good tips from credible people that you think may very well be the case. But for whatever reason, you can't get it to the point where you are positive enough to get it on the air. Because remember, we're not guessing about stuff. We report facts. And so the bar is extremely high to get something on the air. And yeah, that feeling that occurs all the time because you hear something that you think might be right. You, you think it's newsworthy for sure if it is, but you just can't get it over the finish line. So you kind of file it away and you keep working it and maybe you figure it out at some point, but that doesn't always happen. Oftentimes it doesn't. Have you been discouraged? I mean, tr our business really is, I feel like, under attack. You know, I mean, uh, people mm -hmm. have lost a lot of respect. And, and this is what I tell people about, especially local news. I'm like, every reporter in there, I mean, they truly do care about the story. They're really trying to give you, like, the most non-biased fact. But there's just this, like... Uh, there's now this reputation that the media has an agenda. So have you been discouraged over the past like three, four years about the credibility of media and the way people think about you? For sure. For sure. A lot of people have um, a lot of feelings about media, some legitimate, some not. One thing that I think is tough is I think a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people um, just look at it as the quote unquote media and so if one person, one entity is doing something that they may not like for a very good reason, oftentimes that reflects on all of us. So like I would contend that what you see on cable news and I'm not singling out any cable news station, sure. but just in general, a lot of what you see there is very, very different from what you see on local news. And oftentimes I, you know, would urge people to watch our product. I'm extremely proud of what we put out at Fox 5 DC. And I think oftentimes if people say, you know, oh, you're fake news, you're this, you're that, which we do hear quite a bit more of nowadays and we did certainly at the beginning of my career i think if they actually watch what we put out they might feel a little differently because i'm very proud of what we do at fox 5 dc like do people come up to you on the street and go oh fake news or like you're with you're with fox like i mean do people like come up and, and they'll say that's your face really yeah all the time all the time all the time and i'm not talking about like it's it's not like fox specifically you know I, we hear all kinds of stuff about cnn and msnbc but yeah and i, I don't want to like make it sound like it happens every day but absolutely a hundred percent i have been called i'm telling you sir ask any reporter at the station we like we've all been called fake news a, a million times and sometimes that's because of you know sometimes it's because people don't like what we've reported and as long as they're you know talking to me in a respectful manner i'm always more than happy to have you know a respectful back and forth and explain to people you know why we do what we do why we reported what we reported um but yeah i mean that's that's a real thing. I think every reporter probably across the country has encountered quite a bit of that, especially over these past few years. Yeah, it, it sucks because I really feel like people don't I actually. And I really wish local news stations would do a better job of actually pulling the curtain back and showing how hard you guys work. But I don't, I don't know. Right now, it, I don't, it doesn't seem to be happening. But um, all right. Talk to me. You've you've really broke and been a part of some some big stories. You've won an Emmy. Um the George Floyd story. So tell me about that. You you covered the George Floyd right after his murder here, like in D.C., right? All of the yeah. protests. All right. Walk us. What was that like? That was something I definitely will never forget. So this this, you know, major event happens. George Floyd is killed. First, we see these protests break out in Minneapolis. And I actually, I called the bosses and said, hey, you want to put me on a plane? I'll go. Because I actually, I worked in Minneapolis for, for many years. That was where I was at right before I came to, um, to D.C. 
can, you know, this is, this is my home, but I, I was in, I was at the ABC affiliate in Minneapolis for a long time. And, uh, then not too long after that phone call, like the same day, because at, at the time my, my boss was like, yeah, we're, we're thinking about it. Just stand by. I'm going to get back to you. Same day. We start to see protests in DC by the white house. So I head out, that was on a Saturday and it was really interesting during the day, massive, very peaceful protest. That's a term that I think gets overused sometimes, but that, that's what it was. I mean, there were like families and children and, and it was people marching all over DC, that kind of thing. Then you saw a drastic, drastic change and the families went away. It was a much smaller crowd. And it quickly turned into chaos and violence. And, you know, I'm not trying to sensationalize this. It's it's all on tape. But especially that first Saturday, we're talking blocks from the White House. You had the, the tear gas or whatever it was all over the place. I remember a guy picking up a scooter and just like crack, uh, cracking a, a window um, of a business right by me again, blocks from the white house. I remember at one point I'm standing there and we were like live all night, just continuously. And I looked to my left and people actually lit a dumpster on fire. It was a literal dumpster fire with flames shooting out of the top and they pulled it down an alley and pushed it towards this big line of police because police were kind of trying to move the crowd in one direction. I don't know if they were like just, trying to break the police line or cause chaos. But that was what was happening in our nation's capital. It could not have been any more different from what we had covered earlier in the day, but it was a really dicey situation. And that is definitely one that will stand out in my mind forever. And, and, and here's the thing too, like it, it wasn't just that night. Like I'm sure you remember, Sarah, this went on for weeks and in yeah. particular yeah. a couple of days later. So, so that was Saturday, the following Monday, was the whole thing with with um, President Trump Former pulling President up Trump. the Bible? Yeah. Yes, yes, right? and walking Everybody across in, to the in church. Front of the church. Yeah, exactly. So, so we're back out again that day, and we had been through the whole weekend. And shortly after that, a couple blocks up the road, there, police kind of like corralled a bunch of protesters into a group. Um, they had refused. I, I think it was like, you remember, we had like curfews in D.C. Um, after some of that violence yeah. had happened. And these were people who were not violent, but they also were not getting off the street in time for the curfew. So as they were getting arrested, um, we were actually able to do some interviews with some people who were like in handcuffs. And it was really interesting to hear their perspective. I remember one guy. I mean, you can go back and all watch all this stuff. He, he was saying that he was out there because he believed that what he was doing was going to help his children in the future. And this was something that had to be done. So that conviction uh, sticks with me. And, you know, one of the things that we really, really, really worked hard to do was make sure that we got all of the viewpoints into our coverage because this was not a simple issue. This was a deep issue. And a lot of people had a lot of reasons for a lot of the things that were happening out there, both um, good and bad. And yeah, that was something that we worked really hard to Is do. Is it hard to stand by and be not biased? I mean, you're seeing these people light a trash, you know, a big dumpster on fire. Do you ever want to just say to them, okay, hey, why are you doing this? You know, you're 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 going to go to jail. You're destructive. And not even just that. I'm sure over the years, right, you've, you've been filming and watching people make choices, you know, some against the law, whatever. Do you – how do you know? I mean, I would be like, I don't think you want to do that. Like, I would just be <laughs> – how do you not – or do you say things? What? How do you do it? I, it's not – you know, you do this for long enough. That's that's the job. Your job is to to watch and report the facts. And it's not always the easiest thing, but you do this job for long enough. You get used to standing by, observing and reporting. You may ask somebody, you know, why they're doing something for the purposes of reporting. Right. Because you want to give them the opportunity to explain why it is that they're acting in a certain way or doing a certain thing, but it's actually not hard for me to, to stand by and observe just because that is what the job is. I think it's an important part of the job. You don't want to have an opinion or certainly, you know, people are people, everyone has opinions, but you don't want to let those opinions affect your coverage. And that's really important because if you do over an extended 
period of time, I think people will doubt your credibility. And as a journalist, really, when it comes down to it, your credibility is all that you have. Yeah. So for those reasons, I, I'm actually pretty OK with standing by and observing. Um, we heard from Melanie Alnwick, you know, she she I was talking about safety situations because, you you know, you were down there for the George Floyd pro- protest, you know, January 6th insurrection. Do you ever worry? You know, she she said, you know, for her, she's been in war zones. But the scariest part is going out on the street at three thirty in the morning, you know, because you don't know kind of who's coming out of, you know, the darkness or whatever. What about you from a male perspective? Do you ever worry about your safety? Yeah, and more so in recent years than I used to when I was younger. Maybe, maybe that's mostly just because when you're now young. Now you're a dad. Right? It's- yeah, you don't know any better now. It's, so yeah, I, I definitely do worry more than I used to. I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum from Mel um, timing-wise because she's a morning reporter. I'm a night reporter, right? She's on the early shows. I'm generally on our 10 and 11 o'clock um, p.m. newscast. Safety is a concern. However, um, other than just like on the normal day being aware of your surroundings – and doing what you can fox 5 is really good about safety anytime that i felt uncomfortable i just say hey this isn't a good place for us to be we're going to do our live shot elsewhere and then for the really dicey stuff george floyd january 6th a couple of other stories yeah what about what they say they send us security which is fantastic um but like all of our coverage pretty much um for those types of events we have security with us which is really wonderful um, the, the, that first night that I described with the burning dumpster, it was a woman. I, I, you never want to judge a book by its cover. Um, Sarah, because the, the woman that came out with us, this was actually, this was like right off the bat. We really didn't know what we were going into and, and it was kind of spur of the moment. So I, I'm sure it was difficult to get security guards. We had one security guard that night for most of the rest of the coverage. We had two, she was a woman, she, she was a former DC cop, probably pushing about 60 and she comes in like yeah. street clothes. And like a little purse. And I'm like, well, like, okay, like, all right. Like, you know, but I was like, really, is this like, she was incredible. She's badass. She was was badass and amazing. And she like had our back because here's something people don't realize when you're, so it's like me and a photographer, right? It was our our chief photographer at the time. He since moved on to, to a great opportunity. His name Steve Steve Williams. Right. So Steve has a camera and he's looking through the lens. He can't look to his left and the right. I'm looking at the camera. So I'm observing what's happening near us so I can describe it to people. But that's not the same as being able to observe whether like a guy is going to come up and like, you know, cheap shot in the face or whatever the case may be. She was amazing. She was on my back the whole night, moving me this direction, that keeping people off of us. It was great. So like, yeah, safety is a concern. Um, however, I do think the station does a really good job, um, as much as they can of putting us in a good position to report the news, but stay safe while we do it. How, how is it to gain sources? I mean, that's always, you know, again, this is something I could never do because I love to gossip, but you know, I mean, it must be <laughs> like, it must be you. I'm sure you have like some sources that if we knew their names, we, you know, our jaws would be on the floor. How do you get them to trust you? Time and patience. Mm-hmm. I think. It, that that's the key like the the best people for me are people who i've talked to for a long time and you don't just talk to them when something happens and you need information you talk to them when times are good and relaxed and you build a relationship because then they know that they will be treated appropriately that what they tell you will you know be told at least their identity and, and confidence and that's the biggest factor time and elbow grease and mutual trust it's you can't just call somebody the day that you need something and expect to get it. It's a relationship building business. And I think that's the secret to developing sources. And what would you say like the longest time period it was to take you to build a source? Like, cause I mean, that's, a, that's a very, you have to be very patient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, years in some cases, years. And I've had, and you know, it's interesting. I've had situations that start out like really contentious, um, because somebody didn't like a report that I did for whatever reason, but then you keep nurturing that relationship. You explain your side of it and, you know, you talk about peeling back the curtain. It's not that like we're ever trying to hide something, but I do think it helps when people hear like, okay, this is what I reported and this is why I reported it and have those kinds of conversations. But yeah, like that's, that can take years, especially if you get off to a rocky start. Although sometimes the best sources end up being the people that, that you started having a rocky relationship with. I think there's something to be said for like shared experiences, whether they're good or bad. And this is 
probably true of just like normal life too. But like once you go through something good or bad with someone, it strengthens that relationship oftentimes in the future, I believe. Absolutely. So you win an Emmy for your George Floyd reporting. What was it? Was that the first Emmy you had won? No, I've, I've won a couple of them. Oh, um, okay. Where do we keep these? All right. We've got several news Emmys. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a few. I have a few. Oh, um, okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's always a huge honor. And in particular, I really do um, appreciate it. And it means a lot to me on a story like that. Um, actually most of the awards that I've won in the past have been because of breaking news. I like breaking news in part because, um, oftentimes, especially with like the, the George Floyd stuff, that's a time where TV news to me serves a really important purpose for the people at home, the people watching, because when there's like violence, um, like we just talked about by the white house, people for for very good reason, they're not going to go down there and check it out themselves, but they want to see what's happening in their home, what's happening in our nation's capital. And TV news uniquely has the ability to get in there and show people exactly what is happening. And I think, you know, like print reporters do amazing work and in some ways print can do stuff that we can't do on the tv side but when there's big breaking news something like this i think that we are uniquely suited to show people what's really happening on the ground so if i win an award for that type of coverage especially something that is as important and um as as kind of like you know something that that we will remember for a very long time, a significant event in American history, like the death of George Floyd was and is, then, you know, in that sense, the awards do mean a lot to me. Um, In your entire career, what's been the story that's had you like the most, like your adrenaline the most going? Like, you know, you you thrive off breaking news. You're addicted to it. What was the one you were like, I can't get, this is, this is it. Probably the George Floyd. I mean, just because that was, I mean, that's, that was really crazy. You know what I mean? You talk about adrenaline. It's like, you don't know what's going to happen next. So probably that. But then there there are some other days that stand out for other reasons. Yeah. I remember like, really, you'll like this, Sarah. Very early in my career, my first reporter job, I was in Gainesville, Florida, fresh out of college. And like one day I interviewed both Buster Rhymes and the Wiggles. Do you know the Wiggles? It's like they're like a, like a children's act yes, yes. in the same day, and then like the next day you're back out, like you know, behind some like crime tape because there's some sort of like awful shooting or whatever. Like <laughs> those moments too stick with you because you're like, what is this job? Like it's oh like my... local news in particular. It's just it's so random. It's so random. Um, all right, let's talk about your personal life. Is, is your wife in news? Yeah. Yeah. So she's a reporter. Um, she's not currently doing it. Um, she's, you know, taking care of, of the kid along with me. And it's just it's just working for us right now. I, I applaud her for it. Um, and she's so incredibly good at it. But yeah, so we met working in Little Rock, Arkansas. We both work wow. for the Fox affiliate in Little Rock. We started within a month of each other. She's from um, northern Minnesota. I'm from D.C. Needless to say, Arkansas was a bit of a culture shock for both of us and we (laughs) (laughs) we we immediately hit it off and um you know we've been together ever since and that's I I tell her she's my destiny like I like how random Um, is that right like you like I moved to like Little Rock Arkansas of all places and meet this amazing woman you know wife and mother so yeah, we've been together ever since, and it's it's been um, it's been incredible. We uh, are happy to have lived in Arkansas because we met each other. We were happy to leave Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, after, yeah, you're thrilled to leave. You can say it. You're thrilled after, to leave. After a couple of years, and then yeah, so so we went from Arkansas to Minneapolis. We worked at the same station there together as well, the ABC affiliate in Minneapolis, and we were there for a long time. We have family there because, like I said, Catherine, my wife, she's from Northern Minnesota, but we have family in Minneapolis where we live. And um, liked it very much. Winters were, you know, brutal. Like, it's oh, just really oh. rough. And, like, and the lack of sunlight just crushed me. It's, like, depressing. I, 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 it's depressing. It's so depressing. But, um, you know, we were happy to come here. And, and it's kind of nice, too, because, like, we do love going back to Minnesota. That's always going to be such a special place for us. And it's where we got married and we have family there and everything. I was just back there a couple of weeks ago, actually. We love it. But it is nice not to have to report through <laughs> to Minnesota. There. I get it. 
right. Minnesota I get it. winters. Yeah. My husband's from outside Detroit. I love going to visit Detroit, but but Michigan, you know, northern Michigan and and Michigan in general is great in the summer, but that's like it, you know. I mean, the it, rest of the yeah, time is gray brutal, skies. Right? It's brutal. Yeah. Now, did you guys always know that you wanted to have a family, or was having your daughter sort of this spontaneous, like, all right, you know what, screw it, we'll have a kid? Like, was no, this all part it, of the plan? Yeah, this is this is part of the plan. <laughs> this, this is my design. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, no, we're we're big time family people always. Like even in our younger uh, years, you know, we we definitely like to go out more than we do now. But um, family has always been it for us. So this was this is what we wanted to do, and it's been amazing. This last year with my daughter Felicity, I I mean, it's I, I had high hopes, and it's exceeded even those lofty expectations. It's amazing. It does change you though, right? Isn't it a weird change when you become a parent? It's like all these things about life that you never cared about, like suddenly your safety, right? I'm sure for you, you would have gone into any situation. Now, like all of a sudden you think about like your significant other and your child, so much more, right? It's a weird thing. Hundred, hundred percent, hundred percent. Couldn't agree with you more. And like other stuff, like job security. Like, what happens if like I lose my job? Like, how are we going to pay the mortgage? Whatever. These are things that like, of, of course, you think about previously, but before it was always like, oh, whatever, I'll land on my feet. And now those those are more real fears for me because I'm like, oh man, like I have to support my family, my daughter. Well, whatever. diapers it's, are yeah, so goddamn it's, expensive. It's like I've got to keep going. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> crazy. Now, You're not kidding. Yeah, it's baby nuts. stuff not cheap. And the food, it's crazy. All right, well, let's yeah. talk about your upbringing. So you grew up in Maryland, right? Where are you from? Where Where'd you grow up? Yeah, I'm from Rockville originally. I went to um, Wooten for high school. I went to University of Maryland. All my family is still here, pretty much. Um, and yeah, I, I loved it here. So that that was kind of, so. Just to like be clear for everyone, that was kind of my track record. Born and raised here. Went to Wooten in Rockville. Went to University of Maryland. Then I worked all reporter gigs in Florida, Little Rock, Arkansas, Minneapolis, and then D.C. But yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised here. I love it. And it was news like always what you wanted to do? Or like did your family always think, you know, you were going to be a dentist? And then they were like, oh, Josh, wow, news reporter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say it was pretty clear to me that this is what I wanted to do um, late in high school. I guess maybe like very early in college, probably late in high school. Um, honestly, at first it was just like a combination of things that I thought I was good at, like different skills that I thought I would be well suited towards. And then actually, if you want to know the truth, I we do. wanted to do, I, <laughs> All of I, I want, I wanted to do sports at first. Um, and that's so like, I went through journalism school and I do have like the same training that like any university of Maryland kid would, would, journalism kid would, would get, but I wanted to do sports and I had trouble finding a sports job out of college. So I was like still working in a carpet warehouse, which is like where I worked during college. And, um, one news director in Gainesville was like, well, I don't have a sports job for you, but do you want to try news? And I was like, ah, okay. All right. Like I needed work. I wanted to get going. So packed up, moved to Florida and I loved it. I loved it. And yeah, that it was like just one of those happy coincidences because I ended up liking news more than I think I would have liked sports. And then fast forward to now, this job at Fox 5 DC, I get to do a ton of sports at Fox 5 DC, which is great. Like my main gig is news. That's always going to be my bread and butter. However, I like, you know, when the Nationals were in the World Series, they sent me to Houston. It was amazing. I was like in the locker room when they're having the like champagne shower. And I'm a Nationals fan. Like this is this is absolutely incredible. So um, it's pretty cool now that like even though I am a news guy, I get to do a lot of sports at Fox 5. And that's a big plus for me. And so did you grow up with siblings? Yep. Yep. I got two brothers. I'm the oldest. Um we're still very, very close. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're really close. They come over all the time um especially you know again football sundays like How literally your wife like, like that <laughs> oh she loves it you know what we're so lucky because she gets along great with both of my brother's wives so that's Perfect. not always the case but yeah so like they were all like they were all over here um last sunday for instance like i'm sitting in my basement right now this is where we were all hanging the whole family kid and everything and it was great and what did your parents do were they involved in any new stuff i mean like you were kind of like the first person in your family to yeah. sort of go in this <laughs> yeah i'm the, what did I'm they the only do? one um well my dad was in like construction my mom is uh like a diet coach and uh yeah yeah she's really? like really 
she's like insanely fit it's obnoxious if you want to know the truth for the rest of us she's like wow. she's like, like she hasn't had like sugar since like 1982 she's one of this she's one of those types um but uh yeah so no this is this is out of left field there's no journalism whatsoever in my family was that hard growing up with a mom that that was so healthy like did you have any sort of like body image issues i know that's like so taboo for men so like, <laughs> but like know. with a mom that was that healthy no 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 actually and she's like so amazing and supportive and like she it it was never it's not one of those deals where like she wouldn't like let us eat what we wanted to eat or whatever we always knew what we should be eating but we were never stopped from eating whatever we want really and she's like you know really good at just you you hear about it a lot but um but she's pretty (laughs) wonderful at uh at not driving it the the point home uh too much so no there were no body image issues or anything like that it sounds like yeah you guys had good balance that yeah we definitely had good balance and i think we've always been a pretty tight-knit family we're like a talking family so like we talk about our feelings and stuff like that and that's that's how i hope to um raise um you know felicity and and that's how uh my wife and I get by too. We always say that our strength is our communication. Like we really do talk about stuff even when it's difficult to talk about. And that's just something that has been instilled uh, in me from a young age. And I continue to believe in it. I think it's good to get feelings out there and have these deep talks and work through issues because I I think it gets um, really tricky and kind of dangerous for relationships when you keep stuff bottled in and you don't talk about it oh my god 100 percent. especially now that you have a kid right i mean you have to communicate yeah. like even more and you're exhausted and there's all kinds of you know things happening yeah that's that's impressive josh because a lot of people don't have that freedom you know growing up so that it sounds like you guys always had this kind of open healthy family that's terrific that's my mom yeah that's all my mom's doing and i think she really nailed it with that one and i'm very appreciative of that and it's something that i strive to do with my family now it's tough like especially in those heated moments like you never want to do that it's the hardest thing in the world to do in those moments but i i'm a firm believer in it and i think that if you take the time to work your way through that and to talk about things as difficult as it may be i think that's a real recipe for success yeah, 100%. Um, okay, we've kind of been doing like this rapid fire, you know, sort of at the end of interviews. Um, but then it, it turns out to be like a lot longer. But I'm curious, what, what's something um, about you that is there anything about you that you wanted to share with the audience, but you just never have because you, you kind of you don't you don't have like the good day DC gig where you have to like, talk about, right, you know, right. celebrity news, and you got to share your relationship. I'm sure you're dying to reveal something to the audience that you've never shared. What is it? Uh, I don't know. I'm actually, I'm generally pretty like private and like legitimately pretty boring. Um, really? I don't, what what yeah. about, is there anything about your teeth? You have like amazing teeth. Did you have braces for four years? I mean, oh. you have like a really good, and you, you have gorgeous <laughs> eyes too. Do, do oh my God. People come up Very and hit really. on you. <laughs> you're making me blush here. My goodness. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to offend you or you know, or like no, upset no, your no, wife, no, no, no. but I mean, That's you've got so stunning eyes and, and great teeth. Do people come up to you and go, oh, all right, I'll speak to you. I like your eyes. Thank you. That's really nice of you. Teeth, I had a good orthodontist and I was very lucky to have one. Um, and... Yeah, I I do hear I do hear about the eyes from time to time. I I don't know. I just I got lucky. I I have nothing for you in that. I got lucky, and yep, I hear about it. And uh, I think I think it's the, it's the blue eyes and dark hair combo that people seem to like. And like my friends make fun of me mercilessly. Like oh blue oh it's josh's blue eyes again blah 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 like you know they'll be like blue eyes and butt chin that's that's something like i literally heard that in a like i put like a a lot of weekends i'll post like my football picks on like for instance like last last sunday i posted my football picks did well by the way three or four uh on twitter and i had like my i had my kid in in my lap and she also has um very blue eyes and a butt chin and like one of my buddies like copied the tweet into this like you know like the the like text chain that you have with all your friends and it, it was like hashtag like blue eyes and butt chins like and then some not some other comments that i won't give you here but yeah i i do uh i do hear about them <laughs> yeah well it, you can it works for you it is or it's two striking things about well actually three i mean you know i wasn't going to say the butt chin but i guess we'll throw it in there 
Yeah, you can you can comment on the butt chin. I I do. I get, I hear about it. Plenty. Tell us about your biggest dad fail so far, because I have so many as a mom. Like I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys like if your wife was a baby, like if she babysat when she was younger, or like you did. I mean, you know, you're the oldest, right? So maybe you kind of took yeah. care of your younger brothers. But I knew nothing about having kids, and I've had so many fails. What's been your biggest dad fail? I've had a million <laughs> dad fails, Sarah. I'm I'm <laughs> I try really hard, but I'm such a work in progress. The one that crushed me the most that hurt my heart was um we were at my in-laws up in bemidji minnesota a couple weeks ago i was watching the kid she's like crawling around and i don't even think it was really my fault but she slipped her hand slipped from under her you know the balance isn't good and she went face first into a hardwood floor and she was bleeding her lip was bleeding and oh. yeah i know and thank god that's all it was and like you know we put ice on her but she's in tears and i felt so bad and you feel like you failed your kid and there's blood and it's oh my god is there some is there something wrong blah 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 my father-in-law is like a surgeon and like i made my wife call him he was like out <laughs> golfing or something and i was like you gotta ask him you gotta <laughs> just in case and uh so that's one you know my kid she's so active she's like non-stop and like we were at the pediatrician yesterday for her one-year checkup and even the doctor's like i've never seen a kid that moves like this like she's just non-stop that can make changing a dirty diaper extremely difficult oh my especially God. especially if we're talking about a number two so we've had that you talk about dad fails and i mean you you know oh, you the know blowouts the blowouts and the amount of yeah. poop you you get on yourself and just like the amount that they produce you're like this is like i know the amount of times like you're, you're like done. not even 20 pounds where's this coming from how's it like it's so yeah i've got i've got dad fails for you for sure <laughs> It's totally, it's so true. Um, Josh, what, what's the goal? What is the goal? Like, what do you, what do you want to do? I mean, you know, is the goal to be breaking news? Like, you know, for ABC, is it, is it, you know, are you happy where you are and you're just enjoying it? What's, if you could wave a magic wand, what would it be? You know, that's something that I think about a decent bit these days, Sarah, because my goal and like, I don't know, like so many of my peers like want to do network and this and that. I, I, maybe I should, but that was never my goal. My goal, honestly, it was always just to get back to Washington, D.C. This is my home. This is where I wanted to live. And I wanted to do local news. My goal was what I'm doing now. And I don't know, maybe I should, you know, look into doing something else in, in the future. Obviously, I, I would always listen to anybody with an opportunity, um, you know, trying to do what's best for my family and all that stuff. But I am honestly extremely extremely happy here in particular at fox 5 because not only do i get the news fix but like there are not that many places that are going to be like sure you're our reporter that we throw out there in the middle of you know these major protests or whatever well yeah you can also be off the street one day a week and do a podcast about gambling so this this job it really does um kind of scratch that itch for me i feel very lucky to be here and you know, who knows what the future holds, but for right now, my magic wand, I mean, I'd love a million bucks. I'd love not to worry about my, <laughs> yeah, right? We'd like you know, to my make more money. Like, yeah. Right. Like, so I've got wishes. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but like job wise, I, I am very happy. I'm very um, satisfied. And uh, tell me who's your favorite athlete. You're obviously a sports guy. Who's your favorite athlete? Um, I love the wizards. I'm a wizards guy through and through really? historically. Gilbert Arenas is my favorite like that. Yeah. Cause you know, you, really, you, did you ever get to interview him? Yeah. Yeah. So in college, this is, I always tell people, this is actually the best job I ever had. Um, even though I didn't really get paid for it. I was an intern for sports talk 980. That, that was the, it's still 980. It's not sports talk anymore, but yeah, I was in college. This was the most amazing gig for like a sports nut like me and for a wizards nut. Basically, um, I was an intern. They were paying like a stringer. They call it, you know what a stringer is to go to the wizards games every night, home games, and um, basically interview the players after the game and then edit some sound together that they would use on the next day's broadcast. And I was like, Hey, I'll do it for free. And they were like, cool. And they sent me literally, like I still have the press badges. I went to just about every single Wizards home game. This was during the, 
I think it was the 06, 07 season. I always get my years mixed up. It was it was the first year that um, Gilbert had like a really serious knee injury, and the team was great. And then they it just didn't work out in the playoffs. They get swept, I think, by the Cavs. I don't know. I have to, you know, some of the stuff blends together. Oh, but sure. I was there for like every single game, and it was. And I'll tell you what else was great, Sarah. Not only am I going in there and talking to players after every game, recording it, doing what I love. I was I was in college at the time, right? I'm still at the University of Maryland. They, I don't know if they still do, but at the time they fed the media at Wizards games. So I would go, I'd get a free meal before <laughs> the game. I'd watch basketball. Halftime, you'd go back in and they served ice cream. They had ice cream Sundays. <laughs> and then after the game, I would go and interview the players. And it was it was incredible. I mean, it was just like it was like a dream come true for he, sports night. He always has a reputation though as a weird guy. Was that is that true? Like you know, um, I mean he had the I whole didn't... gun incident. Then he then he yeah. sort of mocked it. I mean, people always painted him to be rather odd. But yes, yeah, so that that came a little later. Um, and I I certainly did not know um, Gilbert personally. Right, I was there for like one season, and I was just one of many reporters who would come back and and talk to him. He was always nothing but kind to me. And one thing I loved is like if you asked him like a slightly offbeat question he'd go in like he'd give you a great response sometimes those responses were better than actual basketball questions and uh yeah i found him to be amazing and just as a fan um i always really loved watching him because the wizards have been so bad for so long and then for for me i'm i'm 36 like that was kind of the first team where i was like old enough to like really watch the team and that we were good and we were legitimately good before those gilbert injuries so um yeah that that's my favorite all-time guy for sure um what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given in your career listen more than you talk that was uh one of my one of my uh grandfathers said that way back in the day and that stuck with me and especially for reporting it makes a lot of sense like if you're talking too much you're not learning you're missing stuff but if you're listening you pick up on a lot. And I think that helps in a lot of different walks of life. Um, you know, you grew up here, kind of last question. You you grew up here and, you know, I mean, D.C. is like, you know, the center, right, for so many things, obviously, with the nation's capital. But what do you think makes this area and the viewers, what do you think makes this area special compared to, <laughs> no offense to Arkansas, but, you know, compared <laughs> to like some other, no, sorry, Minnesota. But I mean, what, what do you think is unique about the DMV? It's a melting pot. It's a melting pot, man. I mean, like so many people come here from so many different places. Like, you know, I I loved working in Minnesota, but like in Minnesota, like they do kind of like want to hear from Minnesotans and like same same deal in Arkansas and that kind of thing nobody's from here i mean like i'm from here but like nobody's from here you know what i mean yeah in dc and i think that um makes it a very unique place to live and um it's a lot of different cultures here which i love and i just think that you're exposed to a lot of stuff here in um you know dc maryland and virginia the, the whole like dmv area that that you're not going to be exposed to in other parts of the country Love it. I mean, so interesting to talk to you. And by the way, you never seem like you got one of those uh, reporter voices. I'm really glad about that because, you know, sometimes <laughs> you, you, you know, it's like over the years in the news business, you talk to people and they have a regular voice and then and then they go on here. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I've never been down with that. Like, I know that's like some people are really into it. But thank mm-hmm. you for never getting that. So there you go. Hey, anything for you, Sarah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> of any of this podcast but i think the audience appreciates that you have a real voice thank you very much i do um try you know pretty hard just to be myself because i think that's like that helps you know back to credibility which is really really important um to me like i think you know viewers listeners can tell when you are being you and that's not always easy to do when you are on tv or on you know a podcast or whatever but that is something that i strive to do it's it's great. It, it it comes off very real and natural, which is awesome. Because I feel like I don't know. It's it's a generational thing. I don't want to offend the boomers that are you know listening, but it's like <laughs> our boomer reporter friends like they put on that accent. So thanks for not doing that. <laughs> Man, thank you. That's a very nice compliment. Thank you. Okay. So Josh, when can people? What's your schedule? Are you Monday to Friday? I know you're you're doing breaking news. Tell people when they can watch you and then where they can follow you. Yeah, sure. So um, Monday to through Friday, I'm on the uh, 10 and 11 o'clock uh, p.m. newscasts on Fox 5 DC. Um, good place to find me is on Twitter uh, at 
J, J, Josh Rosenthal TV, J Rosenthal Take TV. Take your I'm time Sarah, to look. I'm, we're, we're... I'm failing you here. I should I'm definitely failing know. you. I mean, I'm the interviewer. I should know. I should like know your. No, 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 is... I should know my own Twitter handle. Handle at Josh Rosenthal TV. And please, if you've ever gambled, if you think it might be something that interests you, check out the Rambling and Gambling podcast. All you have to do is search Rambling and Gambling anywhere you get your pods. Also on IG at Rambling and Gambling. I'm really proud of what we're churning out there and I would love it if people checked it out. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, you're convincing me. I mean, I think I'm going to get in on it and just, you know, throw some caution. Tell, tell, your, hu- tell your husband to check it out too if, he, if he's into gambling. He will love totally it. love it. Totally love it. Josh, this was awesome. Thanks thanks for taking the time and, and uh, so fascinating to get to know you. Um you know, on a more personal level. Thanks so much, Sarah. (laughs) Um, Had a lot of fun. Really appreciate you having me. And hopefully one of these days, we will get to spend a little bit more time together in person. I'll see you at the station. I know, one of these days. All right, Josh Rosenthal, everybody follow him. Amazing.